Section 11.3, limiting reactants. And the objectives of this lesson will be identify the limiting reactant in a chemical equation, identify the excess reactant, and calculate the amount remaining after the reaction is complete, calculate the mass of product when the amount of one or more reactants are given. Some vocabulary review will be molar mass. And some new vocabulary you'll come across will be limiting reactant and excess reactant. Rarely in nature are the reactants present in the exact ratios spe uh, specified by the chem balanced chemical equation. Generally, one or more reactants are in excess, and the reaction proceeds until all of one reactant is used up. When a reaction is carried out in the laboratory, the same principle applies. Usually, one or more of the reactants are in excess, while one is limited. The amount of product depends on the reactant that is limited. Recall from the reaction from uh, the launch lab. After the colorless solution formed, adding more sodium hydrogen sulfite had no effect because there was no more potassium permanganate available uh, to react with. Potassium permanganate was a limiting reactant. As the name implies, the limiting reactant limits the extent of the reaction and thereby determines the amount of the product formed. A proportion of all, uh, me, a portion of all of other reactants remain after the reaction stops. Reactants left over uh, when a reaction stops are excess reactants. To help you understand limiting and excess reactants, consider the analogy below in figure 11.4. From the available tools, four complete sets consist of a pair of pliers, a hammer, and two screwdrivers can be assembled. The number of sets is limited by the number of available hammers, pliers, and screwdrivers remain in excess. So again, if each set were to get two a pair of pliers, two screwdrivers, and a hammer, right, we can go ahead and fill up one of these toolboxes. However, we don't have an extra hammer, so we cannot get that fifth toolbox. So we would be limited by the number of hammers, but we have excess tools, which are your screwdrivers and your pliers. calculations you did in the previous section were based on having the reactants present in the ratio described by the balanced chemical uh, equation. When this is not the case, the first thing you must do is determine which reactant is limiting. Let's consider the reaction shown in figure 11.5 in which three molecules of nitrogen and three molecules of hydrogen react to form ammonia. In the first step of the reaction, all the nitrogen molecules and hydrogen molecules are separated into individual atoms. These atoms are available for reassembling into ammonia molecules. Uh, just as the tools in figure 11.4 are available to be assembled into tool kits. How many molecules of ammonia can be produced from the available atoms? Two ammonia molecules can be assembled from the hydrogen atoms and nitrogen atoms because only six hydrogen atoms are available, three for each ammonia molecule. When nitrogen is gone, two unreacted molecules of nitrogen remain. Thus hydrogen is the limiting reactant and nitrogen is the excess reactant. It is important to know which reactant is the limiting reactant because, as you just read, the amount of product formed depends on this reactant. So we need one um, atom of nitrogen and three atoms, uh, excuse me, one atom of nitrogen, three atoms of hydrogen for every molecule of ammonia. Right? But because we have, what is that, six um, nitrogen atoms and six hydrogen atoms, we're going to be left over with two, uh, excuse me, four nitrogen atoms in the end. How can you calculate the amount of product formed when one of the reactants is limited? Consider the formation of disulfur dichloride, which is used to uh, vulcanize rubber. 
Uh, as shown in 11.6, the properties of vulcanized rubber make it useful for many products. Uh, the production of disulfur dichloride, molten sulfurs react with the chlorine gas according to the following reaction. If 200 grams of sulfur react with 100 grams of chlorine, what mass of disulfur dichloride is produced? The masses of both reactants are given. First determine which one is the limiting reactant because the reaction stops producing products when the limiting reactant is used up. Identify the limiting reactant involves finding the number of moles of each reactant. You can do this by converting the mass of chlorine and sulfur to moles and then multiply each mass by a conversion factor that relates the moles and masses, which is the inverse of molar mass. Next step involves determining um, whether the two reactants are in the correct mole ratio as given in the balanced chemical equation. The coefficients in the balanced chemical equation indicate that four moles of chlorine is needed to react with one mole of sulfur. This four to one ratio uh, from the equation must be compared with the actual ratio of the moles of available reactants just calculated above. To determine the actual ratio of moles, divide the number of available moles of chlorine by the number of available moles of sulfur. Only 1.808 moles of chlorine is available for every one mole of sulfur instead of the four moles of chlorine required by the balanced chemical equation. Therefore, chlorine is the limiting reactant. After determining the limiting reactant, the number of product in moles can be calculated by multiplying the given number of moles of the limiting reactant, which is uh, 1.410 moles of chlorine, by the mole ratio related disulfur dichloride and chlorine. Then moles of disulfur dichloride is converted into grams of disulfur dichloride by multiplying by the molar mass. These calculations can be combined as shown. Right, take the moles of chlorine gas and then multiply by the mole ratio of, di of disulfur dichloride against the chlorine gas and then that converts that to moles of disulfur dichlorine gas and I'll find the mass of the disulfur dichloride gas we're just going to go ahead and multiply that moles by the mass. And you would find out that 190.4 grams of disulfur dichloride forms when we have 1.410 moles of chlorine gas with an excess of sulfur. Now that you've determined the limiting reactant and the amount of product formed, what about the excess reactant sulfur? how much of it reacted. You need to make a mole to mole, uh, excuse me, a mole to mass calculation to determine the mass of sulfur needed to react completely with the 1.410 moles of chlorine. So first, obtain the number of moles of sulfur by multiplying the moles of chlorine by the, mole, uh, the sulfur to chlorine uh, gas mole ratio and we'll see that it is 0.3525 moles of sulfur are needed. Go ahead and take those moles and multiply it by the molar mass of sulfur and you'll see that we need 90.42 grams of sulfur. Right? Knowing that we put in 200 grams of sulfur and that's available and that only 90.42 grams of sulfur is needed you can calculate the amount of sulfur left unreacted when the reaction ends. Right, and that's just the difference between what was available and what was consumed. And we would find that we have about 109.6 grams of sulfur left in excess. Let's check out example problem 11.5, determining the limiting reactant. The reaction between solid white phosphorus and oxygen produces solid uh, tetrasulfur decoxide. Uh, this compound is often called disulfur pentoxide because of its empirical formula, um, P2O5. Determine the mass of tetrasulfur de uh, decaoxide formed 
if 25 grams of phosphorus and 50 grams of oxygen are combined and how much of the excess reactant remains after the reaction stops. Right, to analyze this problem, you are given the masses of both reactants, so you must identify the limiting reactant and use it to find the mass of the products. For moles of the limiting reactant, the moles of the excess reactant used in the reaction can be determined. The number of moles of the excess reactant that reacted can be converted to the mass and subtracted from the given mass to find the amount in excess. So some things that we do know, we have the mass of phosphorus and the mass of oxygen. Well, what we don't know is the mass of the um, tetraphosphorus decoxide. And we also want to go ahead and find out what is the mass of our excess reactant. So let's go ahead and look at our balanced chemical equation. And let's go ahead and convert our reactants into moles and then we're going to go ahead and set up ourselves a mole ratio right between the reactants. We have a 7.72 to 1 mole ratio of oxygen and phosphorus. Right? And we know that we only need a 5 to 1. Um, because we have a 7.2 but we only need a 5 to 1, we can go ahead and say that oxygen is in excess and phosphorus will be our limiting reactant. So use only the moles of phosphorus that determine the moles of um, tetraphosphorus decoxide that will be produced. So multiply the number of moles of phosphorus by the mole ratio of the tetraphosphorus decoxide, which is our unknown, um, to the moles of um, phosphorus, which is our known we can see that we get 0 0.202 moles of uh, tetraphosphorus decoxide. Now we're going to go ahead and get take those moles and multiply it by the molar mass to go ahead and calculate what is the mass um, of tetraphosphorus decoxide produced. And because we know that the oxygen is what's going to be um, in excess we can go ahead and calculate how much of the oxygen do we actually use in this chemical reaction. And we can use that based, upon, based off of our moles of limiting reactant, uh, which is phosphorus in this case. So it looks like we only use about one mole of oxygen gas. Um, go ahead and convert the moles of oxygen gas to a mole to a mass of oxygen gas by multiplying by its um, molar mass and then go ahead and take the difference of what oxygen was available and what oxygen was actually consumed and that will tell you what is the mass of oxygen in excess. Um, go ahead and pause your video at this time and go ahead and try practice problem 23. So here are your answers to 23. Right, I did this a little differently. I just went to go ahead and find out what mass of iron was produced right, for both of those. And whatever one produced the least amount of iron, um, that reactant was going to be my limiting reactant. In case, this case, my limiting reactant was the iron 3 oxide. And my uh, reactant in excess um, was my sodium. Many reactions stop while por uh, proportions of the reactants are still present in the chemical uh, mixture. Uh, because of this inefficient and wasteful, uh, chemists have found that by using an excess of one reactant, often the least expensive one, uh, reactants can be driven to continue until all the limiting reactant is used up. Using an excess of one reactant can also speed up a reaction. And if you look at figure 11.7, uh, it shows an example of how controlling the amount of a uh, reactant can increase efficiency. Uh, your lab 
likely uses the type of Bunsen burner shown in the figure. If so, you know that this type of burner has a control that lets you adjust the amount of air that mixes with the methane gas. How uh, efficiently the burner operates depends on the ratio of oxygen to methane gas in the fuel mixture. When the air is limited, the resulting flame is yellow because of, a, of glowing bits of unburned fuel. This unburned fuel leaves soot deposits on the glassware. Fuel is wasted because this amount of energy is less than the amount that could have been produced if enough oxygen were available. When sufficient oxygen is present in the combustion mixture, the burner produces a hot, intense blue flame and no soot deposits um, can be observed because the, uh, the fuel uh, is completely converted to carbon dioxide and water. And that's kind of what we're talking about. If you see soot, chances are it's incomplete combustion, whereas you know if you don't see that soot, it looks like it's a good combustion. Section 11.3 Summary The limiting reactant is the reactant that com is completely consumed during a chemical reaction. Reactants that remain after the reaction stops are called excess reactants. To determine the limiting reactant, the actual mole ratio of the avail available reactants must be compared with the ratio of the reactants ob obtained from the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. Stoichiometric calculations must be based on limiting reactant.